Welcome everyone to uh, GPAC's first peace education webinar. Um, I'm very happy that you're able to join us today. Uh, I'm, uh, I would like to briefly introduce myself. I am uh, Denise Duzenli and I'm the communications advisor at GPAC. And I see that we're joined by quite a few uh, people, which is great. Uh, for the ones who don't or who are not very familiar with GPAC, I wanted to briefly introduce GPAC and then introduce our uh, uh, lecturer, our speaker, Jen Batten, and then she will um, start with, with the webinar. So um, GPAC was founded in 2003 and is a member-led network of civil uh, society organizations working on conflict prevention and peace building across the world. And our mission is really to promote that we promote a shift in how armed conflict is dealt with. So a shift from reaction to prevention of armed conflict. Um, we work together. Our, our, we work together with our members who are locally based, and um, we have 15 regional networks of local organizations. And um, together with them, we're we're trying to uh, prevent uh, conflict. Um, so we focus on a number number of themes such as human security, gender, dialogue and mediation, but also peace education. Since 2006, we've been working on uh, peace education and um, uh, our members from all corners of the world have been working together to exchange information, skills, strategies and, and expertise on how best to engage and collaborate with key stakeholders in their education systems. Um, so our members have formed a peace education working group, uh, which works on this. And this working group is very, very unique as it brings together civil society, teachers, academia, and representatives of ministries of education and relevant government agencies. And uh, with, these, uh, with this webinar series, we're very happy that they will be able to share their expertise through, through these webinars with you. So uh, Jen, Jen Batson will kickstart the series today. She's the chair of, of, the, of our GPAC Peace Education Working Group, and she's been working with GPAC in peace education since 2004. Um, so she has a lot of expertise in the field. Um, she also recently served as a senior consultant for UNESCO and also served on the Organization of American States uh, Advisory Board. And um, she's also been um, an education director and lecturer on peace education. So uh, before I give the floor to Jen, I wanted to let you know that uh, sh if you have any questions, you can ask these via chat, the chat uh, option. And then we will make sure we, we uh, repeat these questions to Jen and she will answer them after her presentation. So Jen, on to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen here a moment. Great, so thank you so much for inviting me to open our peace education webinar series for GPAC. It's an honor and pleasure. <laughs> and so this particular webinar will be an overview of some of the good practices from the field. And then you're, you'll be able to see on the GPAC's website a list of other uh, webinars that are coming up. And so my colleagues from Ghana and Ukraine, the Philippines, Serbia, and other countries like Armenia, they'll be sharing their good practices specific to their country and how they've done good work countrywide in this field. So I'll start off with a little bit of an overview of some of the good practice research that we know. And I'll also be sharing a lot of resources. So <clears throat> there's not much new in the field <laughs> in peace and conflict education. And what I mean by that is the we know what are the good strategies for teacher preparation, for integrating these concepts into the curriculum. And there's a lot of curriculum out there. So what we'd like to really focus on for this webinar is the methodology and how we teach what we teach. So as we look at the different countries, um, depending on which region of the world we're in, so for instance, if we're in the Americas, we're thinking about democracy education. Um, if you're in the United States, we focus a good deal on social emotional learning. Um, if you're in 
maybe Armenia, you can call it peace education. But what you're gonna see are a lot of the similar concepts. When I did the scoping study for about a year for UNESCO, and we'll look at what the outcomes of that, um, the outcomes of that here in a moment. But when we did that, we looked at um, grouping these concepts under learning to live together. So I'd like to share what I mean though by conflict resolution education because we're gonna be focusing a good deal on skill building both for educators and for students. So conflict resolution education models and practices in culturally meaningful ways. And this is one of the critical pieces that we know through the research we need to do. So not just repackage a curriculum that was used in Rwanda and Kenya and use it in another country, but really adapt it based on um, the culture, including the different aspects of identity, processes, practices, and skills that help address conflict. So ideally, if we're doing peace education or conflict resolution education well in our schools, um, in the community, then we're not just teaching the concepts, but also giving students or young people the skills and enabling them to put those into practice in some way. I do want to share a little bit about social emotional learning because frequently we'll hear this ter term and I believe that in Europe it's gaining more momentum as well is thinking about self-awareness and self-management. So again, the knowledge, attitudes, and the skills. So managing emotions, social awareness. So uh, the ability to empathize with others and responsible decision-making. So that would be things like um, analyzing options and um, using your critical thinking skills to make decisions and relationship skills. These are really key conflict management peace education <laughs> skills. Caring and concern for others, establishing and maintaining positive relationships. Um, and how do we, so both in the definition with conflict resolution and social emotional learning, how do we handle interpersonal situations effectively? And if we don't have those skills at home and at school, it's going to be very difficult to use them in the community. And as we get older in the working world, locally and globally. Some of the great, if you're looking for um, good research studies on the effectiveness of social emotional learning, I wanted to share this website. This is the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. And you'll see this, I copied in the, their webpage. You'll see at the bottom, there are some multicolored um, buttons on what is SEL, SEL in action, research. And so I wanted to share particularly the research and policy and the resources. So if you click on there, you're going to find extensive research studies on the effectiveness on quality teacher education, quality implementation in the classroom, what makes really quality curriculum, and then policy. And that's how do we integrate it both here in the United States at the state level, at the national level, and then resources. There in the field of peace building and conflict resolution, there are quite a few high quality materials that are free and accessible so that you don't have to spend a lot of money to do a good job of implementing this in your schools, colleges, universities, or in the community. I want to start off with some good practice that we know because the skill building is key. So we know through the best practice research, and you can find this on Castle's webpage that I just spoke about, is that without adequate staff development, it doesn't matter how well researched that curriculum is, if the people implementing the curriculum aren't well trained to deliver it and model the skills. So let's look at some of the good practices. Four recommendations for skill training um, when we're looking at training young people is that the curriculum is sequenced. So what I mean by that is, just like in math, the subject of math, you add and subtract before you multiply and divide. So just like in conflict management, so you need to learn understanding conflict, understanding how emotions influence conflict, thinking about anger as a secondary emotion, effective communication skills, and then problem solving. So you need to have lessons that are in developmental order. And Frequently, the curriculum, when I worked on the scoping study that will look at the outcomes here, as I mentioned in a moment, the curriculums that I was reading frequently were not sequenced. So you would teach one 
skill that was perhaps at the end of the spectrum that should have been called last and it's in the middle or it's at the front. And so I think this is one of the things that I have seen that is a key challenge in a lot of the curriculum that are out in the world. So we want to think about that. Active. So learning through role plays, behavioral reversal. Um, so active learning, luckily, more and more um, education, uh, governmental organizations and schools, colleges, universities are focused on active learning. So this would be instead of lecturing to engaging students in cooperative learning. So getting them into groups and having them teach each other, um, using different strategies where all students are are um, engaged in the learning process instead of just one student answering the questions. We're going to have um, here in a moment, I'm going to share with you the Exploring Humanitarian Law curriculum from the International Committee for Red Cross it has one, they have wonderful, wonderful tools specifically, um, regardless of what content you're teaching, but how to do that um, using active engagement that we know is good practice. And then focused. So focus is dedicated time to skills practice. So including that um, Clearly we need the content, the theory, and in addition to that, the skills practice and making sure that we don't cut that short in our classes. And then explicit, so targeting specific skills. So understanding conflict. So what is the cycle of conflict? How does conflict escalate? Some of the specific skills that you might be teaching would be um, how to manage our emotions and how to effectively problem solve or brainstorm options. So when we're talking about conflict resolution skills, and this is part of sharing some of the sequencing of skills, whether we're teaching children or adults in the field of conflict resolution, we know we need to teach some core concepts first. So understanding the nature of conflict, emotions in conflict, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, and this gives you some ideas of what some of the concepts are that, that are under that. Effective communication skills, and problem solving. This, uh, one of the nice resources if you're thinking, well, I teach a certain content area and I don't see how conflict resolution or social emotional learning, peace education skills fit into what I'm teaching. And so um, yeah, this gives you a nice idea of where some of those actual skills versus the concepts fit under like language arts, which would be reading, um, social studies or history, so you have the role play maybe of mediations, evaluating points of view, problem solving, and integrating into math. So frequently I'll hear math sciences, you know, how do you integrate this into what we teach? So it, it can be in how you craft your questions for problem solving, different points of view in science, um, and then in art and music, there are so many ways <laughs> that you can integrate peace building and conflict resolution, um, including in science, which we mentioned. And then for those uh, countries which have guidance or counseling, there um, you can easily integrate communication skills, problem solving, anger management. And here in the United States, quite frequently, our counselors will have special sessions with young people who need some additional assistance in some of these skills and can help them develop that. So many times um, when I would work with schools over the last 23 years, <laughs> at least at the start, I would hear, well, if we just fixed the kids. <laughs> and so as if it was that the students needed the assistance. However, we know that comp we really need a comprehensive approach. So that would include student programming. And so giving not just one group of students who are the challenging behaviors, but giving all students access to these important life skills. And if you look up the core skills, 21st century life skills, or the 21st century learning skills, you're gonna see that these are some of those core concepts that we all need to engage. And so it's not just one of the, the stigmas that I want to help um, rid us of is that Conflict, how we define conflict, conflict is a normal and natural part of everyday life. And I think because frequently when we think of it in a global context, we're thinking of wars. However, if we think about it as an interpersonally, every young person who has had a brother or a sister <laughs> knows what conflict is. Um, or if you have a significant other. Um, so their conflict arises. But 
I want us to be thinking about conflict as neither good nor bad, but a way it, it's good or bad based on the skills that we're able to bring to it to help address it. It can be negative or an opportunity for change. And so hopefully we can give our young people and educators the skills so that when they're faced with a difference of opinion, challenges in the community, that they have the skills to manage, um, hopefully ideally prevent, and then manage and then address those. So we also look at curriculum. So we want to integrate it throughout the curriculum, not just one group of students. So peer mediation, for instance, is a student program that a lot of uh, schools, colleges, universities, community organizations have utilized. Um, and that's wonderful. And we know the good research, and I'll share with you another, the creducation.net web, website, where you can take a look and see some of the research on the outcomes of peer mediation programs. But we know that especially for those students who are trained in the skills of peer mediation. So they learn the content knowledge, they learn the skills, and then they're able to put that, that into practice. The outcomes are, are amazing in the changes and in, in improvement in academic uh, achievement, in um, their own behavior, their ability to manage conflict, reductions in stress. And so we wanna make sure though that everyone has an opportunity to learn those skills. Pedagogy is how we manage our classrooms, and we know this is key. I'm going to come to this here in a moment, especially with our teacher training and modeling those skills. So young people will do as we do, not as we say as much. So what I mean by that is we really need to be able to model those, um, and because they're listening not just to our words, but they're watching how we engage, not just in the classroom, but also with each other in our schools. And then school culture. So this is a key piece when we look at the good practices around the world needing to include administrators. How do we engage parents? So when we have the webinar from Armenia, you're going to hear about some wonderful parent engagement um, that they do around, around the country there. You also want to think about if you have any staff member that engages with young people in the schools. So do you have administrative assistants? Do you have... Um, lunchroom workers? Do you have bus drivers? Those individuals, frequently the conflicts that occur in schools are in many of those locations. And so we want to include them in our training as well. Here are some sample results and outcomes. So again, CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning, that was one of the key websites that I started with. They have some wonderful research studies. I wanted to share this one in particular from, from there where they looked at and 317 studies with 324,000 students, and this is in the United States, in in-school programs and after school. And what I liked about this is they combine looking at students with or without behavioral problems, racially and ethnically diverse students, and in urban, rural, and suburban settings, so in cities, in the countryside. And here were some of the results. So we saw that there was an improvement in student achievement. So one of the wonderful things that I love about conflict resolution and peace education is that when it's done well, not only does it give our young people important life skills that they're able to use in their everyday lives and in the future that will serve them well, it also helps improve their student academic achievement. Um, we also look at increasing social emotional skills in test situations. So decision making, communication and problem solving. These are core social, emotional, and conflict management skills. And in addition to that, that helps them succeed academically. We also see more positive social behavior. So an increased connection to school. And we know that when there's an increased connection to school, that that also means that we will be able to reduce um, truancy and increase academics. Fewer conduct problems. So from the individual young people um, with others, and then also less emotional distress. So we know that young people too, when they're under high levels of stress, have challenges using the problem solving portion of their brain. And so the more we can reduce the emotional distress in the classroom um, and in the school environment, the, the easier it's gonna be for young people to learn. And it's gonna make teaching a whole lot easier as well. And then improved attitudes towards themselves and others. Here is a resource that um, So I mentioned that I worked on a scoping study for UNESCO um, back uh, a few years ago. And what we came up with with colleagues was 
Safety, Resilience, and Social Cohesion, a guide for education sector planners and curriculum developers. One of the, if you, at the end of this PowerPoint, and GPAC will be placing it up on the website so that you'll have access to it, is you can click on that link and you'll find booklets, short booklets that were developed specifically for ministries of education in fragile countries um, around how to create effective learning outcomes, curriculum review, curriculum development, textbooks. I'm gonna focus a lot on teacher development here in the next 10, 15 minutes, and then assessment. So, but you can download those, those individual resources, and part of that scope, year-long scoping study is reflected in this. So this, this was the outcome of that, and you'll have lots of other resources that if you go to that webpage, you click on the actual um, guide uh, for either textbooks or teacher development, you'll also see a wealth of resources from the World Bank, the um, Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, the International Network on Education and Emergencies, uh, save the children. So you name it, the great uh, folks doing good work all around the world, um, this will help bring some of that together. So I'll be sharing some of the good practices from this document that we put together. So I could not stress this more. <laughs> this is the key. So again, regardless of the curriculum we're using, if, if our teachers aren't able to model those skills, and even if, even if we have great educators who want to do well, and they've gone through a training, we also need to provide them with that support because a one-off training is not going to um, be as effective. And we know that our teachers who really want to do this um, appreciate and, and um, it helps build their, um, their feelings of the ability to do this in the classroom with more support. So the better we're modeling these skills, the more effective our teaching will be. And they won't always remember what you taught them, but they'll always remember how you treat them. So in this document that we, uh, I shared earlier is that if the teacher does not convey respect for members of all ethnic groups, lessons on respect for diversity and social cohesion will have limited impact. So if we think about some of the different countries around the world, maybe like Northern Ireland or um, Rwanda, and hopefully our colleague from Rwanda will be able to share a little bit about their incredible work that they've been doing with genocide. But you know, we as educators have to do our own work first. So if you have teachers in the classroom who have been negatively impacted by this con by the conflict, um, if you're in um, some place like the Balkans or um, one of the other countries like Rwanda, that, or just here in the United States or in Europe, depending on our, on our perspective about um, people who are different from us, that's going to be reflected in our classroom. So we really have to do the work not only on what we consciously say and do, but also thinking about our subconscious and how is it impacted and how does it play out in the classroom. So teacher practices that support social emotional learning. So this is from the Center for Great Teachers and Leaders. Student-centered discipline, we'll look at a little bit about that here in a moment. Language that encourages, so, um, and student, language that encourages student effort. Sorry about that uh, bullet point there. And then responsibility and choice is given to students. So having them involved in decision making, that could be including um, having them write classroom guidelines. So clearly the school have, has rules, but in addition to that, engaging the young people in um, helping to think about how are we gonna um, work together effectively so that each of us feels respected in the classroom and is able to learn and reduce bullying, for instance. Warmth and support. So they'll always remember how you treated them. <laughs> it's a great quote, and I don't remember who that's from, but um, so we need to think about that modeling. And then class discussions, so engaging them in discussions that it's not just a long 30, 40 minute lecture, which unfortunately the webinar is a little bit like, but um, having those shorter times and then engage, engaging um, with the students. And then self-reflection and assessment. So balance between that instruction and group learning, so you as the teacher taking the lead there and giving some information, but also putting them in groups on projects to work together, high expectations for students, and then competence building. So um, for the pre-service and in-service, there definitely needs to be ongoing training and support. So one of the things that we know that does not work well is what's called um, the cascade approach, which is where if you're 
training someone in a school district and then you're, you hope that those teachers that were trained will then go and train others. So some of the recommendations, and this is in the teacher development, how will we support and train teachers booklet that you'll see there on the left, is develop master trainers is one idea, who are, um, have a long experience with this work and know the good practices, both in the methodology, so how we teach what we teach, and also the curriculum, and how to, so we can have people who are great educators, but it doesn't also, in, in the classroom, but we also wanna make sure that they're able to help provide good feedback and encourage fellow educators if you're gonna be um, developing master trainers. Provide training across a period of time. So that's, again, not just a one-off training, but providing that ongoing support. And some of the ways to do that could include use of video of expert trainers periodically. Um, use technology. We have wonderful resources, Zoom or Skype or using podcasts, Google Hangouts for those who use Gmail, um, mobile phones around the world that we can use to help provide that support, podcasts. And then follow up regularly with recently trained teachers. This is really important. So for instance, at Wilmington College, um, they would do wonderful work training their uh, future teachers in positive discipline. And when they got out into the schools, um, sometimes if the educators who they were then paired with did not have that same training, they lost hope and they didn't feel as encouraged to use those in the classroom. So following up with teachers with online learning, social media, maybe scattering some periodic training. So you could have the training maybe two days and then a space of maybe a month. And in between have teachers tracking the lessons that they're using and um, thinking about what questions they have. Provide a mobile trainer who can provide feedback on the lessons and delivery and self-assessment. So perhaps periodically, so every month or, or so, however it worked out, wherever you're doing your trainings, have um, a master trainer come in and um, observe the classroom and help provide feedback to the teacher when the students are gone about some different tips and answer their questions. Another way to do that, because that could be really expensive, is encourage teachers to videotape their classes as they're delivering them, and then they can submit those online and get some feedback from the mobile trainer through a Skype um, or a Zoom meeting. Train in teams so that, that teachers can support each other. So, if you're gonna be doing training teachers across a region, ideally they would come um, in teams. And so maybe that's the social studies or the history teachers, those who are teaching literature because it fits so well in reading uh, these concepts, um, guidance counselors, health, uh, other subject areas, have them come as a team so they can support one another because what one remembers, maybe another one doesn't remember as well and um, they can help based on their skill sets. So for pre-service teacher training, so this is for future teachers. So these would be teachers who are in colleges of education who are preparing to go out and have their own classrooms. So some of the good practices we know are provide time during the training for skills practice and to receive feedback. And I would say that's both, not just for pre-service, but in service, so current teachers as well. Trainers should vary training methods and model skills and lessons as they provide the training. So um, some of the different methods of engaging students in the classroom. So maybe it's through role play, maybe it's through the use of difficult questions and have them model some of the different classroom management strategies. Prepare trainers to answer questions or concerns about the content methodology. And I would say that's both for pre-service and in-service. And then provide opportunities for those future teachers to practice in the local schools and receive feedback. So here in the United States, um, the young people who are training to be teachers generally go out and do a, what we call a field, um, field practice. And so they would go out into the classrooms and then they can get feedback not only from teachers but also from students. Methodology. So some of the things that we know from the re references that you'll see at the end of the PowerPoint from the Organization of Security Cooperation in Europe, UNESCO, CASEL, is that learner-centered teaching is key. So that's thinking about, so for instance, if you're teaching young people in um, Rwanda, 
you want to connect content to the student's own interests and passions. And those may not be the same as the curriculum that you receive from Kenya. Maybe the students don't have the same interests and passions. Um, you want to really learn about your students. Do your students love sports? Great. We can use um, different, uh, looking at different kinds of conflicts that might occur um, around sporting events. Or you could think about, do they enjoy, now one of the things that kids love is slime. <laughs> I've seen my colleagues in Ghana love, uh, their children love to make the slime, and my godchildren in the United States love to make the slime. So let's mix this in with science. Um, so cooperative learning. Students work in groups, which we mentioned a little bit earlier. Relating content to real life experiences, this is key. Students are gonna get bored quick. Um, but one of the wonderful things about conflict resolution and peace education is we can relate these to their everyday lives, both at home and at school and in the community and locally and globally. Active learning. So again, this is participatory teaching. We're going to get to that here in a moment versus just memorizing content. And respectful democratic classrooms. So some people call them democratic classrooms. Some people call them, call it positive discipline. Um, and so this is basically what I mean by a democratic classroom is engaging young people in decision making. Um, and giving them, helping them get some of their basic needs of belonging, power, freedom uh, in the classroom at. And that's a core component of positive discipline. And this will help reduce conflict and improve student learning. Encouraging positive discipline, um, again, improves, includes appropriate consequences, as well as new skills or ways to help prevent negative behavior from happening again. So instead of, so one of the things that we talk about is the difference between discipline and punishment. So with discipline, there are still consequences if, if a negative behavior happens. Um, however, the difference between discipline and punishment is, and, and with punishment, there would be consequences. Discipline would include um, an opportunity to learn a other skills or strategies so you help prevent that behavior from happening again. In addition to that, um, frequently with punishment, the consequences may or may not be appropriate or related to the misbehavior. And so with positive discipline, those consequences would be related. What I'd encourage you to do, because we don't have time, positive discipline could be a two-day training. <laughs> you can Google that term, and hopefully you'll find some wonderful work. Jane Nelson has done a lot of great work, and um, some of those concepts and resources will also be in the guides from UNESCO. Building positive relationships and developing competencies and in being able to teach the skills of analysis, perspective taking. Here's the resource guide that I mentioned from the International Committee for the Red Cross. It's a methodology guide that these, even if you're not teaching humanitarian law, this is a great resource that gives um, sample teaching methods around discussion, brainstorming, using dilemmas, small group work, and these are active um, methods of engaging the entire classroom instead of just one or two students when a teacher stands up in front of the class and asks a question. So I'd encourage you to um, the links are at the end in the references, but you could also Google or do a web search for methodology guide, a preparation manual for EHL teachers. Here's an online learning module that, again, at the end in the references section, you could click on and go through this. This was something myself and colleagues developed with, for the U.S. Department of Education, and it's creating a comprehensive program. So some of the beginning stages, and this would even though it was developed by the U.S. Department of Ed, it, when I was um, preparing for this webinar and I was reflecting on what was done for UNESCO that was to be um, developed specifically um, or primarily for um, fragile countries, these are some of the key things that you need to do when you're instituting any kind of a program in a school, whether we're in um, the Philippines or if we're in Colombia or if we're in um, Canada. So thinking about that. One is assessing the needs. So checking out what it is that the school um, is currently doing. And this is one of the challenges that I see is, is for a lot of our schools, they're already doing so many different things. So where would whatever the program on peace education or conflict resolution best fit? Secure administrative support and how do we maintain that support? 
Um, this is key that you'll also see in the research from uh, in the UNESCO documents. Oops. Uh, also orienting staff. So even if some, if the rest of the staff aren't going to be trained or have decided not to be trained in social emotional learning or peace education, is giving them information about what you're going to be doing. Um, give them opportunities that maybe at this moment, if they don't feel comfortable doing it, that then there'd be opportunities later for them to have training. Explain why you're doing it. Don't be afraid to answer the question why. <laughs> and in fact, frequently, as educators in the school, even if you start with a small group, see, see the benefits um, for the teachers who are participating, they're going to want to come on board later, the majority of them. And clarify the staff expectations of involvement or support. So we know as educators, oh my goodness, educators, um, I'm not quite sure how teachers fit 60 hours into a 24-hour day, <laughs> 60 hours of work. But frequently our teachers are so overworked all over the world, and they have such good hearts, most of them, that are doing this work. And so adding one more thing to their plate um, during the limited class hours can be um, a little overwhelming. So we want to think about how much time we're going to be asking of them and um, share that up front. Select your site leadership team. Now this is something that, um, so maybe if you're going to send a school as a team, so four or five educators, that who's going to be um, included in that, thinking about who will be in charge, and that also helps coordinate some of that ongoing training and learning um, that's happening. Ideally, you'd have an administrator as a part of that team because they're in meetings that educators, sometimes our classroom educators don't have access to. And please don't forget to include staff. So those would be other, um, maybe the administrative assistant in the offices or parents as well. Um, if you have bus drivers, if you have other staff who counselors or others who work and come in or volunteers or mentors, please include them too if they're interested. They can be great supports. Let the students know what you're working on and why you're doing it and how it benefits them. Select students and staff that also might be part of the program and then providing the training. Again, we looked at some of the good practices in the training and so don't um, overestimate the amount of time it's gonna take. So when I worked with, um, one of my roles in the past was to serve as the director of education programs. We had a state government office on dispute resolution and conflict management. So my job was to work with 3,600 public schools here in the state of Ohio and our 52 colleges and universities that train teachers. And one of the things that I would hear from our, our schools was, well, I tried that and it didn't work. I said, okay, tell me what you did. <laughs> And they would say, oh, well, we, you know, we had three lessons and the, well, the kids, the behavior just didn't change. And so one of the things I want us to be thinking about too here with these skills of social emotional learning and conflict management is that these conflict management or our responses to conflict are learned skills. And we either learn them at home um, or we'll learn them at school and they're like a habit, they're an auto response. So think about how long does it take to change a habit? So <laughs> a habit could take, frequently when I ask that question, I hear 21 days or 30 times of trying something new. The point is it's gonna take time. And if you have young people who have behavioral challenges, it's gonna take even more time. So on average, we've seen about 25 lessons um, hour-long lessons, teaching skills, um, again, sequentially in the order that the skills should be taught about 25 lessons before you start to see behavioral change. So that's going to take some time. So don't think because you, hey, I taught a lesson and the child's behavior didn't change <laughs> that, that that's it. But what you are going to start to see even early on in those 25 lessons is a change in vocabulary, awareness, attempts at trying to use some of the concepts, and keep going because the students can learn those skills and they'll be able, you'll start to see changes. You want to publicize the program, so that could be with parents, including letting the community know what you're working on and peace building and conflict resolution, um, and then utilizing the program. So um, coordinating with other initiatives. This is key depending on um, 
where you are in the world, many of our schools have a lot of other programs that are happening, maybe bullying prevention initiatives, safe school initiatives. So coordinating with those so that we don't duplicate efforts. Um, or if you have community organizations that are doing some great work. And then refresh those skills and knowledge. So again, that's that ongoing training that from the good practice from the UNESCO document and maintain a high profile in the school. So um, young people and teachers will only use the, the skills um, and the different programs if they know about them. So keep it in the forefront for parents, administrators, and other educators who aren't part of what you're working on. And then be sure to, on an ongoing basis, evaluate what you're doing. And that can be having students do assessments of, you know, how has, how has your behavior changed at home or um, maybe in the classroom or, or even just giving you as an educator feedback on, hey, do you like how we did this lesson today or um, how could you use this lesson? And using that as feedback for you for improvement ongoing. Here's another great resource that you could take a look at and this was um, created by Dr. Bill Warders from Wayne State University and colleagues and you can take a look at uh, a little bit more information on the website. So it's creducation.net about who all the funders were and all of the others who helped um, create this web page. But you'll see down at the bottom, one of the things that I really want to focus on are the doors there. And you'll see researchers, teachers and trainers, policymakers and administrators, Siri around the globe, and the partners and projects. And for those who are interested in ongoing staff development, there are lots of free resources on, under the teachers and trainers door. And then for those of you who are researchers, there's research on the effectiveness of this work, but also some free assessment tools that you could use in your classrooms, and you could adapt them for the work that you're doing. So again, you'll be able to access this PowerPoint with references um, from the GPACS web page, hopefully here in the next week. And thank you so much. I'll turn it over to my colleagues at GPAC so that they, we can have questions now. Thank you very much, Jen, for your very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, indeed, I would like to open the floor now for questions. Uh, you can ask your question via the chat, or if you prefer, you can also raise your hand and ask it um, um, orally. Uh, we, we have our first question already from, I am, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this correctly. If not, uh, I'm very sorry, from uh, Chintan Modi. And the question is, how can peace education include empowering teachers to address structural violence against LGTB students on campus and in their communities? Denise, can you repeat that question one more time, please? Yes, of course. Uh, how can peace education include empowering teachers to address structural violence against LG LGBT and uh, students on campus and in their communities? Great question. So some of the um, really good tools are from uh, teaching tolerance, and you can access those as educators for free online, um, and uh, they have a lot of great tools around anti-harassment and bias in the classrooms, both K-12, to but also on college campuses. So I'm not sure where our speaker is from, um, but, uh, or if they're speaking about K-12, to so primary and secondary, or in colleges and universities. Could we maybe get an idea of where they're, where they're from? Like if they're talking about primary or secondary education, Mojisola? That'll help me. Uh, hello, uh, I'm from India. Oh, okay, great. So um, are you interested in uh, resources for primary and secondary, or are you interested in resources for colleges and universities? Uh, I tend to work as a teacher educator with uh, teachers, mostly working with uh, middle and high school students. OK, great. So I think some of the resources that are available from teachingtolerance.org their anti-harassment and bias curriculum would be really helpful tools. Um, even in India, I think 
uh, you might need to adapt those culturally for the for who you work with there. Um, but those are some good tools. And also from the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, even though sometimes people think, what in the world, <laughs> they, how do they have anything to do with education? They actually have some great anti-harassment and bias um, curriculums that you could access as well. And what I'm happy to do is based on that, your question, sir, is to, um, when GPAC uploads this PowerPoint, I'll also, um, ask if it's actually would it be possible for me to send some links to some other resources Denise and Martin uh, thank you so yes much. definitely definitely that. we can uh, yes because we have all everyone's uh, email address so if if we need to exchange more information uh, pers personally then that's fine great and so maybe when you upload the PowerPoint online too um, onto the GPAC website we could put some links based on the specific questions, like um, for India, um, how to, you know, help teachers um, be inclusive in their classrooms around different aspects of diversity. Yep, we can do that for sure. Great. Thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think we have another question from uh, Melaine. Hi, Melaine. Hi. Hi. One of my friends from France. Yay. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we Hi. can hear you. Hello. Yeah. Jennifer. Yes, um, we are trying to implement things here in France, but um, uh, the main problem we have have is to convince uh, the teachers uh, about a preventive approach. They're more prone to ask for help uh, for in postvention, you know, like uh, there is harassment or conflicts, what do we do? Right. We don't resolve, uh, they, they, we, don't, we don't have a good uh, evidence here in France to tell them how important it is because it's not really yet part of the curriculum. They're trying to put an emphasis on that, but you know, uh, habits takes uh, time, uh, and uh, <laughs> it takes time also to to uh, you know to make the teacher think it could be a good idea. So, do you have other examples of uh, like very convincing uh, and ready? Uh, tools to you know to to convince them because i'm trying but uh, i'm not uh, having a lot of success <laughs> so you're interested in helping to convince them yeah. to the use some of these that, skills uh, for prevention instead of me, yeah yeah it's calling me in prevention uh, when there are problems uh, uh, how to implement all these uh, you know tools uh, preventively uh, as you say they don't have time and uh, they focus on the academics and uh, they really believe the, the, the parents and uh, should be in charge of that and uh, anyway they will learn by themselves. I mean I think it's time frequently you would know best clearly Melaine about what does interest them so are they would they be interested more if they saw the reductions that in discipline in the classroom if they spent a few hours you know, a week on teaching these core skills. I mean, you could even um, teach one lesson a week, um, and we still, as long as you don't miss the weeks in between, um, you will still start to see behavioral change. So if they would be willing to even try it out. So I guess a couple things I'd do it. One would see if they'd be willing to just, or one or two of the people who are your biggest um, um, okay. people that don't, really think it's going to work, yeah. you know, yeah. see if they'd be willing to just try it, you know, for, for a month or so and see how that impacts the student's behavior. Um, some, okay. some might be willing to do that, even if it's one of them, because then if one of those individuals from their group who doesn't believe it's going to work, then starts to see and becomes a believer then it can help make change. Um, another way would be there's a lot of good research and throughout Europe as well on, um, from the Council of Europe, which I can send you some of the links, um, or I can add them to GPACs links that look at the impacts in um, the classroom, on classroom, impacts on classroom management, and impacts on um, 
increase in academic achievement. So if educators are really motivated by the tests and academic achievement, then, um, you know, is it the research that they need? And then who is it from? So maybe they might say, well, I don't really care what's happening in the United States. That's not my context. So if they need it from Europe, you know, then we find the research from there. So um, all the other thing is there have to be some schools in France that are doing some of this good work. And I wonder if it's, um, or if you found a YouTube clip I mean, I don't know what motivates them, but the other thing to do, because a lot of times our educators would say, oh, that's a great concept, but I don't have time. Where am I gonna fit it in? So one of the things that we did in the state of Ohio for our 3,600 public schools was we worked directly with our Ohio Department of Education and the curriculum that we developed was linked to the state tests. So we actually linked the concepts to what already had to be tested. And that's one of the things in the UNESCO document that. Um, the link at the end of the PowerPoint, you'll be able to um, see is that they encourage integrating it to whatever assessments have to currently be done. So that's definitely possible with these skill sets, especially in like reading and literacy or linking it to history in different countries, the core concepts. So um, okay, you know, which, which uh, uh, like specific uh, skills uh, would you start with to convince them? So I think it would depend on what they teach. So if they're teaching, one of the things I'll ask Dr. Kathy Bickmore from the University of Toronto to see if I can um, include it in the updates for GPAC. Um, they, Dr. Kathy Bickmore from the University of Toronto has done um, a four page uh, overview of, it lists the subject area that you would teach, like, history or whatever and then it would list all the different kinds of skills that you could teach so maybe I would give them a sampling of of some of the different lessons that they could pick and choose from to use um, if they teach history so what are some of the subject areas that they teach oh it's primary level so it's like very uh, you know they teach everything they could teach every, all every kinds kind. of things. sure yeah sure so let me see if I can find um let me see if I can find a couple of sample lessons and I don't have them in French, unfortunately, but I could find a couple of sample no, lessons and then you could. I can translate. Yeah. Yes, you definitely can. <laughs> like where to start. So sure, sure. Great thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. Um, actually, this was also a question by uh, Yasmin as well, but it's answered now. Uh, are there any other questions? Oh, yes, wait, there is um, uh, Yasmin, you have another question. Maybe you can ask it um, directly. Yasmin? So how can teachers teach yes. peace education safely so they're not seen as threats by the government or too radical? So that's an interesting question. So one of the things that I shared a little bit earlier was that um, depending on what country, even in 2004 when GPAC was starting and we hosted a conference at the United Nations and there were over a thousand participants from all over the world, one of the working groups was on education, on you know, using education for peace building. And all of the, the different folks who came there from, we had representations from all of the world's regions. One of the things that we noticed, it was like the second slide, is that we called it different things, but we had similar kinds of skill building um, sets. So, you know, here in the United States, even back in the 1980s, <laughs> for instance, I'll just give you this example, the state government agency that worked on you know, they wanted to develop a, a peace education commission. It was a peace commission that the governor wanted to start. And the Democrats and the Republicans couldn't, they agreed on the mission. So the mission didn't change, that we would work in education as well as in courts and communities. And we would teach these core skills. They thought those were important. But what they said was that um, 
they didn't want it to be called the Peace Commission. <laughs> so I find that a little funny. But what they agreed on then was that it would be called the Commission on Dispute Resolution and Conflict Management. And so sometimes it's changing the, um, the title of what it is. Um, and th these are really core life skills again. So I personally am not, you know, if, if you need to call it some other name, but we're teaching the core skills are the same. Um, it doesn't matter to me. So if you look at, for instance, something that around the world and education, we're looking at in colleges and universities and K to 12 is, um, global education, or if we're looking at something called 21st century learning skills, they don't call them conflict management, but you look at what the core skills are in those, those, um, in that list, and you're going to see the same thing. So, um, you know, I think it just depends what your country is, what you're able to call it. And also a big key piece everywhere, and this is for Melaine as well, is thinking about where does it fit naturally? So if you're already teaching, like if your school or college or university cares about 21st century learning skills, that's the big thing, or career readiness, right? So where in the world do we not want our young people to be ready to, to um, perhaps get a job when they leave or to be ready to be um, engaged citizens, whatever that means. Um, so whatever it is that you need to link it to. And then what are the core curriculum standards already? The nice thing again about conflict resolution or peace education, you can link in the core concepts into what you already have to teach. So um, I think part of it is what you call it. And I think part of it is how do you incorporate it or integrate it into what you already have to teach. And that takes some skill the integration piece and the more familiar teachers are with it the more comfortable the more readily they'll be able to do something like that and integrate it so i don't know if that helped a little bit yasmin but if you're able to i'm happy to speak further but there's some of the options i think thank you any any other questions I think there are no more questions if I look at my screen. So, so what I what I'd like to do then is um, <laughs> is, is there some time um, is there a certain timeline that you think before we'll have the webinar posted or the resources that you'd like to get it up, uh, Denise? Like in in a week or two? Yeah, weeks? in a week. I think by next week we can uh, we can. Um have it up and Great. online and then we can share it with everyone of course Great. yeah and then what i'm happy to do as well is share my email which i'll put in the chat here so if any of you have further questions um i'm happy to answer them by email or we can set up a skype time and there it is i think it's up there I'm happy to set up a Skype and speak with you further, but also what I'll do is if in the week I get some additional questions like we did from uh, Chintan Modi from India, then I'll also send you some of those resource links, uh, Denise and Martin from GPAC, and maybe we can add those to under the uh, PowerPoint so that we can help um, everyone access those resources. Yep, definitely. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much. And Melaine, let's keep in touch too. And it was wonderful to be with all of you. And I hope that you'll join our colleagues on the GPAC webpage where you signed in for the Zoom. Um, not sure when you signed in, but now there's a list of the other upcoming webinars. And do you mind um, letting us know, Denise or Martin, uh, what the next one will be and the time and what the directions are so we can sign up before we close? Yeah, I'm just, um, um, I just shared the link with everybody. Uh, so it's on our, on our uh, uh, website where you will find more information. But the next uh, upcoming webinar will be held uh, on 20th of February. And it will be given by our colleague, uh, Ms. Tatiana Pogovic. And she'll be talking about school mediation in uh, multi-ethnic communities in Serbia. And then we have one every month. So if you check out our, our, our website, then um, yeah, you can, you can follow us. You can follow all the upcoming webinars. Great, and something else I'd like to share is that, so I did post in the chat room my 
email. If you want to send myself or GPAC, um, it might be quicker to send it to me and then I can get it to my colleagues at GPAC and to our um, members who represent all of the world's regions. If there's a certain topic that you'd really like to see that you don't think is covered, um, not only by us, but other places, then please send us that. So for instance, like Chenton's comment um, from India, then we'll see if some of our colleagues would be willing to do a webinar on that. We do hope to have one each month. Um, and so we'll be, we've got lots of great colleagues with expertise around the world who'd be willing to share that. So thank you so much. Thank you, and um, hopefully till next time. Thank you very much.